Francis Levy, co-director of the Philip Tatey Center. Edward Decessian is the other co-director. And welcome to Our Life in Poetry, post-war Polish poets. And before I begin this evening's program, I just want to make a couple of announcements. On July 10th, we are having a program called Place, Imagination, and Identity. And this is a roundtable that's being conducted by the Remind Group, R-E colon Mind, which is a group of young people who have attended Philoctetes. They're neuroscience students, graduate students, and undergraduates who formed their own group, which we're sponsoring. And this is a kind of autonomous activity under the rubric of Philoctetes. And it's going to be examining, it's a little bit like our psychogeography panel. It's examining the effect of environment on the formation of artistic identity, actually. So that is on July 10th. Uh, our current art ex exhibit is the architecture of emotion, interior and exterior. You'll see it on the walls here. And please check out the annex. It's curated by Hallie Cohen, who does all the exhibitions here, or the most of the exhibitions here in the Phil Tate's space. So now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Michael Braziller. Michael Braziller is president and publisher of Persia Books, an independent company he formed in 1975. He's also director of the Philip Tatey's Poetry Series. Uh, Mr. Brazilla will host tonight's discussion and introduce our distinguished guest. And before we start, I want to remind everybody or tell everybody that we are selling books uh, this evening. So please, in the annex, you will afterwards be able to buy books of poetry by our guest. Thank you. There's a bright student in the corner raising her hand. Cell phones. Please, keep your cell Please phone call phone. each other. Please, Please start calling each other. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that we're concluding this year um, and uh, we're already planning uh, next year's program. Very exciting and very rewarding. Um, and I don't want to forget to say that our guest will be reading some of his own poems. Um, after we discuss this, uh, um, this amazing uh, collection of poems that mostly uh, Ed has picked out, I think we're really, really lucky. Um, uh, and I want this uh, final class to be as freewheeling as possible, and that would include your participation, too, because uh, these are very unusual, really, really uh, great poems, and I think uh, I, I want to delve as much into the poems and celebrate the poems and experience the poems as much as possible with this little uh, distraction. Edward, uh, Edward Hirsch has published seven books of poems for The Sleepwalkers, Wild Gratitude, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, The Night Parade, Earthly Measures, On Love, Lay Back the Darkness, and Special Orders. He has also written four prose books, including How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry, a national bestseller, and Poet's Choice. He edits the series The Writer's World, Trinity University Press. Um, he has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Awards for Literature, and a MacArthur Fellowship. He taught creative writing at the University of Houston for 18 years and now serves as president of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Welcome, Ed. Thanks a lot, and it's good to see you. Um, so how do you want to do this? Maybe I should start by just saying something about po Polish poetry. I, I don't know how much you, can you hear me okay? I don't know how much you know about Polish poetry and mostly I want to experience the poems but I might, you might say that in the laboratory of, of poetry, post-war Polish poetry is a particularly interesting example of uh, poetry under certain conditions, as it were. And you have a group of unusually talented poets, but they're also suffering through something collectively. And uh, the way that Polish poetry uh, after World War II justifies itself and establishes a relationship between the individual and the community, I think, is of great interest to, to poetry. And I just will say one thing about, we're going to talk about Czesław Miłosz and the half generation of poets after him, in particular, uh, Rosevich, Herbert, and Zimborska. And what I would say about them collectively is just to remind you that um, this poetry went through the cri these people went through the crisis of uh, two totalitarianisms, and the first is World War II, and um, 
I just want to remind you that Poland lost one fifth of its population in World War II. Six million, six million people died in Poland, and that, that's you know, leaving aside all the Jews, just Poles themselves. Um, uh, and then uh, almost immediately after uh, after the sort of takeover and destruction of Poland um, by the Nazis, the Germans, uh, they almost immediately um, uh, uh, had the affliction of the takeover by the Soviets and the Soviet imposition and then suffering under the, 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 the Soviet system. So I would say two shameful ideologies that some of the most aristocratic and individual poets in the world suddenly had to suffer together. And the question is, how individually and collectively did they respond? And what I think you'll see from, the, when we're, from where we're starting is that these poets try to reinvent poetry from the ground up is if all values, aesthetic and social, have been stripped away, and now where do we start with poetry from its origin, from its beginnings? And that's what I mean by the laboratory of, of, of poetry trying to invent itself um, after what seemed like the end of the world. Um, I, I'd, I'd add a little to that, and I'd say that, that they almost seem to have a... a, a, a a, uh, a sensibility that is so far-reaching, that has been so affected by personal or by, by their own experiences, by what they witnessed, that, you, you know, we were talking before, we almost seem to get into to a zone of some, I don't know, we'll get, we'll get into it when we look at the book, but also uh, just something that is very, very deep and far-reaching and either mature or heightened in some way that, that is very distinct to me. Uh, I, I think it's a very adult poetry. A very mature, a, a very, very mature it's a very poetry. Mature poetry. That, co that, that comes out of all that they saw, both parallel their own personal experiences that they had, like we all do, but this, this horrific historical thing. Created a collectivity and a collective experience. You just can't ignore, I mean, even poets who were not inclined to social values at all, and you'll hear my ideas about Polish poetry as we go, but I don't think that these poets set out in particular to become political poets, right. the way, say, that Latin American poets do. Right. Um, if you think of someone like Neruda, he just is all out as a po political poet, no problem, no issue. These poets, in my opinion, did not set out to become political poets. It was in a certain way forced upon them based on what happened. And I think that's what we'll see their sort of, in some way, reluctant response to something that they couldn't ignore. That is, no matter how much you want to write, say, just love poems say you're a love poet and you want to write love poems, you cannot ignore the fact that your country has been destroyed by two ideologies. Right. It affects you. And so even... It affects your very relationship. Poems, it affects exactly. a, a, an early love that you it, might look back on. That's it was, right. It, and so it sort of warps poetry in a certain direction. And that's what I think we'll see is where the collectivity comes in and where the individual, individuality comes in and how poetry thinks about its role in the world. Right its seriousness of, 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 of its job, what its task is. And I think that's part of the self-consciousness of Polish poetry is, you know, what is poetry which does not save nations or people. Right. Do you want to start and read one or two of the Milos poems, or where would you like no, to No, I'd like to start with, with a Rezevich poem um, called In the Midst of Life. I don't if have, you don't mind. No, 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 no. Uh, I don't have a good copy of that, but go ahead. Go ahead. Go does ahead. That, do you not have this? It doesn't. Uh, I, I don't. Didn't come out. It, that's one didn't come out. But read it anyways. No, okay. it's a terrific, and that one it's a simple, lends itself to reading. Right. I mean, even without a copy, this is one you won't have a it's, good copy. It's not, it's not hard to follow. Right. Um, the, reason I, the reason I'd like to, Rezevich is younger than Miłosz, and Miłosz is, is the larger figure. Rezevich is still alive. Um, but I wanted to read him because in some ways he strikes the first blow. And you'll hear immediately what I mean in terms of recreating poetry. He was 24 years old, and he published a book called The Survivor and Other Poems. And this is the poem that's always struck me most powerfully, called In the Midst of Life. 
after the end of the world, after death, I found myself in the midst of life, creating myself, building life, people, animals, landscapes. This is a table, I said. This is a table. There's bread and knife on the table. Knife serves to cut bread. People are nourished by bread. Man must be loved. I learned by night, by day. What must one love? I would reply, man. This is a window, I said. This is a window. There's a garden beyond the window. I see an apple tree in the garden. The apple tree blossoms. The blossom falls. Fruit is formed, ripens. My father picks the apple. The man who picks the apple is my father. I sat on the threshold. That old woman who leads a goat on a string is needed more, is worth more than the seven wonders of the world. Anyone who thinks or feels she is not needed is a mass murderer. This is a man. This is a tree. This is bread. People eat to live, I kept saying to myself. Human life is important. Human life has great importance. The value of life is greater than the value of all things which man has created. Man is a great treasure, I repeated stubbornly. This is water, I said. I stroked the waves of my hand and talked to the river. Water, water I would say. Nice water. This is me. Man talked to water, talked to the moon, to the flowers and to rain, talked to the earth, to the birds, to the sky. The sky was silent. The earth was silent, and if a voice was heard flowing from earth, water, and sky, it was a voice of another man. So you see what I mean by poetry inventing itself from the ground up. And the reason I want to start with this poem is because it begins, it sets the theme so clearly for me. After the end of the world, after death, I found myself in the midst of life. So this is the ultimate catastrophe. It's already happened. It's after the Holocaust. It's after the end of the world. Now what do we do? I'm still in the midst of life. Life still seems to be going on. Let's create things from the ground up. And that's what I mean by the weird, radical suspicion of all general ideas, the distrust of rhetoric, of any false sentiments, the sense of the belief in concrete tangibles, that feeling, this is a knife, this is bread, a knife is used to cut bread, as if you have to rediscover the simplicity of physical things because all general ideas can't be trusted. And then immediately you have almost the new communist ideology coming in with man must be loved. I learned by, man, by day and by night what must one love. I would apply man. These sort of general categories, they don't seem to have any meaning. But it's almost like a school book primer. But back to this, there is a bread, there is a window, this is what the window's for. This is what I mean for poetry trying to invent itself from the ground up, and starting over again. Some of the poems you've selected, um, they, they're even self-consciously discussing what you're talking about, That's what right. the role of poetry is, That's how right. it shouldn't be ornamental, That's how, right. how they have to honor what happened with silence, Milos says in, in one of the poems that will yeah. come. And, yeah. and, uh, and why what the why they turn to po what value poetry has or what in light of what happened too many of the, some of the poems will begin to uh, touch, the joy of writing yeah um, is about is somewhat about the need to write in the midst of in the midst of life or in the, in, the, in the nature of the memory that they have in the experience that's so shattered. I mean, one of the things that's striking to me as an American poet is that poetry has an important place in the national consciousness, as it does in almost every small country, and in fact, almost every country in the world except the United States, where it's got a somewhat marginal place. But in a country like Poland, um, poetry has a tremendous amount to speak to um, the evolu evolution, the evolving of a national consciousness, and something that's Polish in, in light of these two... Um, well, occupations, you might say, or destructions. One, so, one, one Nazi, one German, one, one Soviet and Russian. So what I wanted to start with is this 
you can see poetry being stripped down to its basics. You can't see the poem on the page, but you can see, you can guess there's no punctuation. There's a sort of um, avant-garde classicism. And what, if we were going to have a full seminar, what I would sort of show you is how, what we take you through is how each of the poets we're going to discuss begins here and then moves on to something else and how they engage um, the building up of values. And one of the reasons that I think that Rezevich, um is the most limited of the poets, we're not going to come back to any others of his poems, is because in a certain way, the nihilism that you get in Rezevich after the war never changes. Mm -hmm. And um, he basically, he, he discovers Beckett. Mm -hmm. he comes and, and he begins to write plays but he's also written poetry but the poetry I would say although I like much of it all the way through doesn't really have any development whereas in Miwosh Herbert and Zimborska you see a certain you see a certain right. kind of you see a certain kind of development but Rezevich I wanted to start with him he's the least known of the group that we're talking about because he strikes the first blow so should we move on to me? Can Walsh I read now? one? Can I read yeah, one? please do. Um, which one would you like me to well, read? Uh, I think Encounter, you should. Uh, Encounter is a wonderful little poem. Oh my poem. God! Is this a tremendous? It's a stunner. Yeah. <clears throat> Encounter. We were riding through frozen fields in a wagon at dawn. A red wing rose in the darkness, and suddenly a hare ran across the road. One of us pointed to it with his hand. That was long ago. Today, neither of them is alive, not the hare nor the man who made the gesture. Oh, my love. Where are they? Where are they going? The flash of a hand, streak of movement, rustle of pebbles. I ask not out of sorrow, but in wonder. This is a, a very early poem of, of Miwosh's, and but it wasn't published here till very late. Um, and uh, it wasn't published in English until his, his book Bells in Winter. Um, so it seemed to us, when we first read it, like a late sort of right. quasi-metaphysical poem about an investigation in the time. But when you realize this is actually where he started, it might tell you what kind of poet in a way he was going to be um, before uh, politics intervened before World War II came, before he became a resistance fighter, before he had a moment of believing in communism, before he became a mm -hmm. diplomat, before he decided that communism was the, the great evil and wrote the great treatise about, tri tre about communism in the early 50s, The Captive Mind. This is before all of that. And um, it's a beautiful little poem about an encounter, but also the question he asks um, is really a question about time. Right. which to me sets out one of my primary suggestions to you is he wants to be a metaphysical poet. He doesn't want to be about what killed, neither of them is alive, not the hare nor the man who made the gesture. It's not about what killed them or who killed them or whatever. It's just how do we, how do we experience time mm -hmm. and what a mystery that is. Um, this also, the end of this um, poem, uh, uh, has given gives me a clue to something that I want to make a point for you, which is in the next poem we see dedication. We're going to see Miwosh suffering from survivor's guilt, right. which is one of the um, one of the most powerful elements of this poetry. Um, it must be why it, I relate to it so powerfully as a Jew. Is it such a guilt-ridden? poetry, um, uh, but it's, it's just feel overwhelmed with survivor's guilt. But I would say, when I read Encounter, I realized that there's also a sense in his poetry of survivor's wonder, right. which is, I ask not in sorrow, but in wonder, is survivor's wonder, which is something we don't talk about so much, is incredible sense of the marvelousness that it, we exist at all. And so there's the there's the guilt over existing, but there's also the ask: How is this possible? That you know they die and we live. Yeah. 
I love the line. You know, he he has these one. He can get away with these inc not get away with these incredible ambiguities. Like one of us pointed to it with his hand. Right. How can you get how can he get away with that? But he, it's great. You know yeah. that. Who how was he, it? Yeah. Which one? And yeah. how, and if he did it, why wouldn't he? You know. And yeah. And yet he's going at something so much more deep and profound. And I always come back to Brodsky's great quote. I heard Brodsky read L.G. for Anna and teach it once, Joseph Brodsky. And they were good friends. But he said something about Milosh and about poetry that he liked in general. He said something, the unbearable, realiz is the unbearable realization that we cannot grasp our experience. And, the, and, it's, and it's made more, the task is made more difficult the more separated in time we are from it. Hmm. And this, I think, is some, something he's getting at, you know. That'll be especially powerful in the next one in the yeah, case. Yeah. Should, should we go ahead? You, yeah, why don't you, can oh, you read that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, now this is, um, now we're at, at the end of World War II, Warsaw 1945. You whom I could not save, listen to me. Try to understand this simple speech as I would be ashamed of another. I swear there is in me no wizardry of words. I speak to you with silence like a cloud or a tree. What strengthened me for you was lethal. You mixed up farewell to an epic with the beginning of a new one. Inspiration of hatred with lyrical beauty. Blind force with accomplished shape. Here is the valley of shallow Polish rivers and an immense bridge going into white fog. Here's a broken city, and the wind throws the scream of gulls on your grave when I am talking with you. What is poetry which does not save nations or people? A connivance with official lies. A song of drunkards whose throats will be cut in a moment. Readings for sophomore girls. That I wanted good poetry without knowing it that I discovered late its salutary aim, in this and only this I find salvation. They used to pour millet on graves or poppy seeds to feed the dead who would come disguised as birds. I put this book here for you who once lived so that you should visit us no more. So first of all, do you see that this takes up the next step after Rezevich and begins to make it a program. That is, try to understand the simple speech as I would be ashamed of another. Yes. That is, this is one of the premises of Polish poetry, is let's see if we can make language as transparent as possible. We can't, but I would be ashamed by this connivance with official well, lies. There's also a simpler sort of idea that he, that he has to honor the fallen with, with silence, with, minim That's right. with minimalism. That's right. Yeah, because and that was in the Rosevich. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, exactly. You whom I could not save, yeah. listen to me. And he's speaking to the dead here. Um, and then I swear there's no wizardry of words, no lies, no you know, no falseness. And then really, I wish I could speak to you with silence because that's the only appropriate speech. Um, and then for what strengthened me was for you was lethal. And um, this sort of, this stanza, the uh, fourth stanza sets the standard, I think, for what po Polish poetry asks for itself right after the war. What is poetry which does not save nations or people? So this sets the bar very high for the seriousness of purposeness that's involved in this poetry. And that I wanted good poetry without knowing it, um, that I discovered its salutary aim is one of the persistent motifs in Miłosz's work. The poetry is supposed to serve human ends. Um, and then in the last stanza, I think you find something extremely odd or interesting, which is um, instead of calling the dead back, right. he asks them to go away. Um, he, he's from Lithuania, and he brings forth this Lithuanian folk custom. They used to pour millet on graves or poppy seeds to feed the dead who would come disguised as birds. The dead, it's an old folk idea that the dead come disguised as birds. And that I put this book here for you just like that. But not so that you won't, would come back, but so that you won't come back anymore. So that you who it's, once it's lived... the most powerful line maybe in the whole poem and yet I'm not sure I'm not sure why so go go ahead yeah. well it's why, so why does he want them to go away and why does he it's so as I said it's so powerful I mean, because I think it's unbearable yeah 
I think it's unbearable. I mean, the dedication is listen to me, but the, the survivor's guilt or the guilt of surviving is so overwhelming, is, is so much to bear that he can't stand it. And so instead of calling them back, he's actually trying to banish them. He's, I mean, it sort of reverses this traditional idea of calling forth the dead. Right. He calls forth the dead in order to have them go away uh, because it's just too much. It, it suggests on some, on some other level that, that he wishes none of this had happened or would ever happen again. That's a minor little nuance. You right. visit us no more, that would imply that, that this is never repeated. Right. But you're on to something much, much, more, yeah, uh, much more profound than that, that... that Without being confessional or egotistical, he's, he's saying it's too much to bear. It, right, yeah. right. He doesn't say why. Yeah. He doesn't say what his right. part in it was. Um, and I would say it's personal without being confessional. Right. Right. But it is personal. It does speak with an eye um, from his own point of view. Um, but it also it, it just brings up what is the role of poetry and how is poetry going to consecrate the dead? Right. And so, I mean, Polish, and how much of it can we take? I mean, this comes in yes, elegy to NN. Can we take? Yes, it can. We cannot. He has a line, um, and, and only remorse that we did not love the poor ashes of Sackenhausen with absolute love beyond human power. Yeah. I mean, it just it just can't go on. You know. Yeah, it, we're over, it's so overwhelmed by grief. Yeah. There's such a sense that the poetry begins being so overwhelmed by grief that the question is, how do we go on? And, and we're good, not up to it, and no and one is up, up to it. it. Yes, yeah. it's commensurate with it. And, that, and so, but this, I think, sets a tone and a feeling for what the responsibility of poetry right. is to respond to it. So when I first discovered this in the 60s, I felt the seriousness, I mean, I was young, I was 18, but I discovered, I, I felt the seriousness of poetry, the seriousness and the purposefulness of poetry. I think I was looking for something, but that's one of the things it offered to me was the high purpose of poetry. What is poetry which does not save nations or people? The sense that there's no in me no miser wizardry of words, and what poetry has to answer for all these dead and what it has to answer to. So that's, that's where this, so the question is, I think you'll begin to see, um, how do you build values? How do you create values out of this? You've unwittingly, or maybe wittingly, you've, you've gone from an elegy with the, 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 that earlier poem, what, de, not that, uh, uh, um, the one you just in read. In the midst of life or encounter um, is what we've um, Encounter, right. which is sort of an elegy. To, to where some of these people begin to go, which is sort of beyond elegy. That's right. To, I mean, and, and it seems like our writing doesn't often or can't do that. You know, the, the, they go to awareness, surviving beyond. So you right. pick one poem that wasn't political or historical, which is just a simple elegy, just a just that's a, right, beautiful, a sort beautiful of lyric, a, a, the work of, of the lyric. mutability, or that's the, right. You know, to to. Um, uh, you know, to, to dedication, which, which has to deal with how we go on and what we think about. Yeah, but I mean, even the idea seems not a particularly American idea. You, the sense of responsibility in our interdependence, right. you whom I could not save, listen to me. I mean, that means it was my responsibility to save you, and I couldn't do it. Yeah. Should we keep going? Yeah, yeah. Um, This simple speech. Do you know anything about how it is in Polish? Is he is he using a very relaxed or demonic kind of language? I, I don't. Really, I know that Polish is meant to be an exquisitely literary language. So I'm just curious uh, if you know anything about how it really comes across. In uh, I, I think that. Um Miłosz was reacting against a group of poets called the Scamanderites, the Scamander group of the 1930s. And they were poets who, who really loved a kind of vital Bergsonian lyricism. And they wrote in traditional forms, and they liked high music. And um, I think that Miłosz, I mean, later he begins to import different kinds of poetic effects, but I would say here it's as stripped down in, I don't know Polish, but it's my sense that it's as stripped down in Polish as it is in English. 
and that it's very colloquial, it's very simple, it's radical in its simplicity, and it's a quote, you know, anti-poetic nature. There's, I, I wish we had time and, and to read a, a wonderful piece by uh, the prose writer Gombrowicz called Against, um, Against Poetry. It had a very big impact on Polish poetry. Um, uh, I'll just give you a little, a little plug for one moment. I'm editing a series for Trinity University Press, and Adam Zagievsky edited a book called Polish Writers on Writing, which is comments by, about writing and about poetry and about prose and the nature of writing from Polish poets. And, and this book has Gombrowicz's essay against poetry. And Gombrowicz really attacks any poetry that is not human-centered. For, for, for poets, for always going on about high lyrical effects, mm -hmm. um, always falling in love with words, um, always turning their backs on human beings. And in a very uh, funny and ironic essay where he goes, you know, why do people are afraid to say they don't like poetry? I don't like poetry, he says. Here's why. <laughs> and since Gombrowicz was so central to all of these poets, the essay had a big resonance. So it's like um, this poetry is, I would say, against pure poetry. That is, if you think of poetry as a continuum, and on one side would be Mallarmé, and poetry with, with, with its, you know, total musical effects with as distant a relation to re reality as possible. I would say that Miłosz is at the other end, at least here, and he's, he, he has a rage against pure poetry, and he's seeking something very <coughs> impure. And I think you'll, to, another way of answering your question is with our next poem of Miłosz's. I think we should move on from it. Yeah, yeah. Do you, could do you read that? Do, do we, we have read? time for Ars Poetica? Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think you'll, you'll hear the answer to, the, to this, because even the Ars Poetica is a question. I have always aspired to a more spacious form that would be free, free from the claims of poetry or prose and would let us understand each other without exposing the author or reader to sublime agonies. In the very essence of poetry, there's something indecent. A thing is brought forth which we didn't know we had in us, so we blink our eyes as if a tiger had sprung out and stood in the light, lashing his tail. That's why poetry is rightly said to be dictated by a daemonian, though it's an exaggeration to maintain that he must be an angel. It's hard to guess where that pride of poets comes from when so often they're put to shame by the disclosure of their frailty. What reasonable man would like to be a city of demons who behave as if they were at home, speak in many tongues, and who, not satisfied with stealing his lips or hand, work at changing his destiny for their convenience? It's true that what is morbid is highly valued today, and so you may think that I am only joking, or that I've devised just one more means of praising art with the help of irony. There was a time when only wise books were read, helping us to bear our pain and misery. This, after all, is not quite the same as leafing through a thousand works fresh from psychiatric clinics. And yet the world is different from what it seems to be, and we are other than how we see ourselves in our ravings. People, therefore, preserve silent integrity, thus earning the respect of their relatives and neighbors. The purpose of poetry is to remind us how difficult it is to remain just one person, for our house is open, there are no keys in the doors, and invisible guests come in and out at will. What I'm saying here is not I agree poetry, as poems should be written rarely and reluctantly, under unbearable duress, and only with the hope that good spirits, not evil ones, choose us for their instrument. So there's a remarkable humility in this in, in, in this poetry and this idea of, an, of the art of poetry and the Ars Poetica. And um, you can see that, that Miłosz grants to poetry its tremendous irrational power. He doesn't argue that poetry is philosophy. He's aware that poetry is something that's dictated from us, that it's, it's got a kind of a tremendous unconscious irrational force, um, um, which is one of the reasons that Plato was so afraid of it, um, is because not that, 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 not, not that it's not powerful, but it's too powerful. 
and that it, it, it unleashes all this demonic thing inside of us. Now, what's interesting about, about Miłosz is that most poets praise this power inside us because it's part of what I would call poetic thinking, the kind of work that poet, poetry can do that other forms of art can't do, or that other forms of discourse, I should say, don't do so much. This is one of the strengths of poetry. But Miłosz goes, where does that pride of poetry come from? What's so great about being dictated to by, you know, being inhabited by a city of demons? Um, because these irrational forces, what, what, what have they brought us? And maybe we should think a little harder about this. Um, because where has this gotten us in the 20th century? What has it led to? And so he, he's very aware that it's hard to remain one, a single person with a single set of values. Um, in that way, he's very, I would say, modernist. Um, but the question is, how does one respond to that? And all speaking to the, all, all, all aware have a, have a real consciousness of you know a culture in peril. That things can be used against us. Things are used against us, and you can see there's a sort of um, uh, there there's an argument being made increasingly about standing up on behalf of a human-centered poetry of putting human beings at the front and center. Um, and with a hope that, you know, um, something good can come out of it. So, you see, I think this is also a question, uh, an answer to your question about what kind, of, what kind of language does he use. I think you see it's polemically meant to be somewhat flat and, uh, and, 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 and not so lyrical. Um, Maybe we should keep going to her. I Can mean, we read some of the Zimborska? In a way, she, some of her poems almost eerily kind of parallel his in some, in some ways. I mean, she's different. Um, sure. But the notion of what do you think about? What, where right. do you go? How much can you deal with? Um, where do you want to start? I could her? read Reality Demands. I love or, that poem. Let's start okay. with that. This will be a very, okay. uh, very helpful. Okay. Now, Zimborska, maybe while you were getting ready, I can just say something about her. Um, Zimborska and Herbert are, to me, the two most interesting poets of the generation, the half generation after me, Walsh. And um, they, they have a somewhat different path in their skepticism of, uh, of values. And that's that um, Zimborska had a moment of believing in communism. And her first two books um, are, show some commitment to socialist realism and to communist ideals. And after the famous thaw in Poland, or a thaw in Poland in 1956, um, following a philosopher named Kolakowski, she became disenchanted with communism and never, never looked back. Um, but it led to a kind of radical skepticism about all general truths, especially social ones. Um, Herbert, on the other hand, never had that moment of believing in communism, which is why he was such a hero for solidarity. And um, he, nor, Miłosz went into exile, but Herbert stayed in a kind of internal exile and did what he called writing for the drawer, which is he couldn't publish. Um, he wasn't allowed to publish, but he went on writing. Um, so it may, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a difference in their arcs and paths. Reality demands. Reality demands... We also state the following, life goes on. At Kine, at Borodino, at Kosovo, Polje, and in Guernica. There is a gas station in a small plaza in Jericho, 
and freshly painted benches near Billahora. Letters travel between Pearl Harbor and Hastings. A furniture truck passes before the eyes of the Lion of Charonnet. And only an atmospheric front advances toward the blossoming, blossoming orchards near Verdun. There is so much of everything that nothing is quite well concealed. Music flows from yachts at Actium and on board couples dance in the sun. So much keeps happening that it must be happening everywhere. Where not a stone is left standing, there is an ice cream truck besieged by children. Where Hiroshima had been, Hiroshima is again manufacturing products for everyday use. Not without its draws is this terrible world. Not without its dawns worth our waking. In the fields of Mashowis, the grass is green, and on, the, and on the grass is, you know how grass is, transparent dew. Maybe there are no fields but battlefields, those still remembered and those long forgotten. Birch groves and cedar groves, snows and sands, iridescent swamps and ravines of dark defeat where today, in sudden need, you squat behind a bush. What moral flows from this? Probably none. But what really flows is quickly drying blood and is always some rivers and clouds. On the tragic mountain passes, the wind blows hats off heads, and we cannot help but laugh. Um, a great responsiveness to the natural, you know, to, to spring, to the world, a joy in being alive. Um, in the same breath, an awareness of what took place. All fields are battlefields. You know, in a certain way, maybe that's true. You know, that every field that we look upon and something maybe banal or a truck is going across it or something, a kid is playing a game, something, something probably, unspeakable. Probably every, probably every sidewalk you walk on in New York, someone died there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no offense, but... Um, it's, it's scary and eerie and worth thinking it's, about this. It's, and, the ne it's the next step after the Rezevich poem after the end of the world, after right. death, this is a table, this is bread. She goes, well, now it's 15 years later, 20 years later. She goes, well, let's just face up to it. Reality demands, that is truthfulness demands, let's admit it, life goes on. We said after Hiroshima there would be no more life, but in fact, there's another Hiroshima now, and in fact, there's an ice cream truck right there. So... A truthfulness to reality means I have to admit this. Life is going on despite all this unbelievable horror and catastrophe. Right. So what she does is she goes to all the places of the hugest 20th century catastrophes, right. right, to those locales, and she finds banal things that are going on there, and she remembers the catastrophe, and she goes, daily life is also still going on, let's admit that. Right. So there's a tremendous awareness of suffering, but there's also a recognition that in some ways, even worse, things get forgotten. There's so much nothing that everything covers it over. Well, this is, I was trying to make a point before, when you pick dedication, encounter and then dedication, this, it, it could in a way be an elegy or a remembrance of, of, you right. know, of some terrible thing that took place in those mountain passes. Right. But time passes, life goes on, and she has to, and we have to, live with an awareness of that paradox that we, we can't hold that moment. We're beyond elegy. I mean, she's, she's floating in some zone that, that is, I, well, I think... I think yeah. she's a philosophical poet. Um, that is, it's got a personal tone, and she speaks from the we and I, but it's not really... I lost my relatives here, right, or right. my family died, or my lover died here. It's a sort of, it's a, it's a kind of meditation on, on a subject. And what's unusual about Zimborska, I think, which is different than Miłosz, and really different than Herbert, too, is that really she's a conceptual poet. That is, most poets begin with some kind of particularity 
and they move from there. Um, not all, but right. but many do. Right. But Zimborska, I don't really know exactly, but she seems to begin with an idea. Right. Um, and then the idea is illustrated by various particulars. So the idea is driven by um, the specific places, which are the exemplums. But the premise of this is reality demands, that is truthfulness, the way that life is de demands that we admit this, life goes on which is just a sort of simple thing that people say, and she's going to now prove it to you. And she's going to prove it to you. She's, in a way, going to make the case by going to all these sites and demonstrating that where Hiroshima had been, Hiroshima is again. And we didn't think anything would happen. Now we go about as if we don't even know what happened, um, all these battlefields. All fields are battlefields. Yet. You know, this, the human race seems to have this tremendous capacity to cover over all the nothingness and keep going. And you know, on tragic mountain passes where someone, where people, you know, huge numbers of people died, we see someone and the hat, his hat is flying off in the wind, and we laugh. So it's a kind of recognition, I would say, somewhat philosophically oriented to how we are as a species. But it, it also, I would add to that, that it, it, under one small star, which I hope you'll read now, yeah. the final line is, oh, myst I think something like, oh, mysterious, oh, mystery of being. Right. And I, and I think she gets at, I mean, that is a very eerie, mysterious idea. These notions right. that she, they may be philosophical, but at the end, to, they're to personal and they're on deeply the pulse. personally, yeah. and they echo an awareness which right. is, which, as you were saying, is very adult. Is right. It, yeah. Well, what I would say is that it's a philosophical poetry of um, of someone who's lived through a lot, right? Who's experienced a lot, and she's not writing confessionally about her own experiences, but only a person who's experienced a lot could possibly have written these poems. That is, they're based on. Um, a, a, a lot of things haven't hap having happened to one as a sort of backdrop. And that's what I mean by an adult. Yeah, and she wasn't just writing about Hiroshima. Clearly, some of these things did affect her directly, right. too. She saw yeah, Hiroshima. No, she's there. She, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, under, this, is, this yeah. is a poem that's all apologies under one small star. My apologies to chance for calling it necessity. My apologies to necessity if I'm mistaken after all. Please don't be angry, happiness, that I take you as my due. May my dead be patient with the way my memories fade. My apologies to time for all the world I overlook each second. My apologies to past loves for thinking that the latest is the first. Forgive me, distant wars, for bringing flowers home. Forgive me, open wounds, for pricking my finger. I apologize for my record of minuets to those who cry from the depths. I apologize to those who wait in railway stations for being asleep today at 5 a.m. Pardon me, hounded hope, for laughing from time to time. Pardon me, deserts, that I don't rush to you bearing a spoonful of water. And you, falcon, unchanging year after year, always in the same cage, your gaze always fixed on the same point in space, forgive me. Even, it turns out, even if it turns out you were stuffed. My apologies to the felled tree for the table's four legs. My apologies to great questions for small answers. Truth, please don't pay me much attention. Dignity, please be magnanimous. Bear with me, O oh mystery of existence, as I pluck the occasional thread from your train. Soul, don't take offense that I've only got you now and then. My apologies to everything that I can't be everywhere at once. My apologies to everyone that I can't be each woman and each man. I know I won't be justified as long as I live, since I myself stand in my own way. Don't bear me ill will speech that I borrow weighty words, then labor heavily so that they may seem light. Can you tell us who the translator is? Because it's, oh, yeah, you it's know, different than this. So I want to know who translated yours. This is um, uh, uh, Stanislaw Baranchak and Claire Kavanaugh. And, and the one you all have is from that book, uh, 
fair, uh, the miracle fair, miracle fair, and that's you, you know that book. I know you've yes, that book. Yes, that's translated by Joanna Trezia. Trezia, for sure. But I, I think that the the more, in a way, that's a response to the definitive translation, right, right, okay. which is um, Berenchek and Kavanaugh. It's a, it's a wonderful translation. It's, and that, it's, I think you can find all, all of her poems in a book called Poems New and Collected. Um, it seems to me, there's, if I could say something for a moment about Under One Small Star, there's something comical in the proposition of this, which is just apologizing to everything. Right. And it begins with a weird, um, a weird kind of joke, which is you apologize to a philosophical concept. I apologize to Chance for calling it necessity. And then she goes, well, my apologies to necessity if I'm mistaken after all. And she starts, starts apologizing to things, um, um, and she starts mis mixing categories um, to get to um, uh, the, the conflict that one feels in human emotions. Um, but... Um, I noticed that a lot of people, because we're all at a, at, a, at a certain age in the room, everyone laughed when you go, my apologize to old loves for, you know, the latest, for thinking the latest is the best or whatever it was. Um, my apologies to past loves for thinking that the latest is the first. Yeah, whoops. Um, um, but then um, it gets to what I think is behind the whole things, which is... Um, my apologies to everything that I can't be everywhere at once. Now, there's something comical about apologizing to everything that you can't be in all places, but there's also something true about this, which is she's apologizing for limited perspective, for being a single human being, from having a perspective that she can't escape. And that's what all of this is leading to. My apologies to everyone that I can't be each woman and each man. Well, of course you can't. But I'm sorry about it, because what that means is I'm locked in my own perspective. And what that perspective means is that even though people are suffering right now, um, I'm sleeping calmly. And even though um, people are suffering tremendous wounds and suffering right now, I'm still bothered because I pricked my finger. And so there's a tremendous awareness that suffering is going on, and I can't be aware of it and conscious of it all the time. I'm still limited by my own perspective. And what's more, sometimes I'm going around and I'm gleeful, and sometimes I'm happy, and sometimes I'm just worried about my new love and so forth. I mean, there's a real awareness of human perspective here and a, and a kind of interrogation of what that means. But it's, beyond it is also this central fe feature of Polish poetry. Right. The guilt behind it is tremendous. Right. As Milos would have said, I apologize for having survived. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what's behind this, isn't it? I'm living my life. I apologize for all these other lives that are so, that, that, that they can't recover from the trauma and from the ongoing traumas. Um, and then I would say this also is a kind of ars poetica with a question mark. It becomes it at the end where she goes, don't bear me ill will speech that I borrow weighty words, then labor heavily so that they may seem light. Okay. And I would say that's the perspective of this poetry is a kind of weightiness and a kind of seriousness with a kind of light touch. And this is what I mean by a, a, sil a philosophically inflected poetry that's right. personal, that the idea, the formal idea here is a poem that's a series of apologies. Right. But you think of an apology as something that you do to a person. And here she gets this somewhat comical idea. What happens if I apologize not just to people, but to concepts, <laughs> to ideas, to feelings? to people I don't know, and so forth and so on. So I think there's a very representative Zimborska poem. Yeah, yeah. There, there really is a comic touch there. It's my apologies to those. It's, it's, uh, it's almost playful. It's almost saying the task is impossible, the task of absolute love or you know, of absolute attention. Or right. It's all so overwhelming that it's almost... Right. And to yet which she feels she has to apologize, so that's the element of the guilt. So there's that's, this, but the guilt, and, and yet uh, almost a sassy kind of comic, uh, it's impossible, it's undoable. And I, you know. I mean, you can see that it's the next step after Miwosh, right? Where the suffering is unbearable, and then the next step is, 
Well, reality demands, let's face it, right, right. on tragic mountain passes, people are also laughing. Yeah. yeah. The, the world didn't actually end. Life is still going on. Let's observe that, too. Do, do we have time for a Herbert poem? Yeah. Uh, we, we definitely do. I hope we, um, we've got... Why don't, we, why don't we do at least one Herbert? And then the question is, should, should we attempt to read Elegy for NN, which... Oh, you want to do that first? I'd like to, no, I'd like to, I'd lo, I, I would like to indulge myself and do that and then have you read a couple of poems. Why don't we do one okay. Herbert poem, maybe one of the Mr. Cogito ones, yeah. or Pebble is, is such an example of a lot of things, what you're talking about, too, but... No, I, I well, if we're just going to read one, I'd rather read Mr. Cogito and the Imagination. Cogito, okay, let's do yeah. that, and then because I'll I, attempt... I, uh, the, okay, Elegy go ahead. For okay. I mean, I'll just say something about Pebble, okay. which is that along the lines of where we started, um, um, Herbert decided to begin with a sort of cool poetry that is a rapacious love of the concrete. And one of his early books is called Study of the Object, which is where Pebble occurs. And you can see that against the false sentiments of human beings, the pebble is something that can be trusted. <laughs> Right, because it, it, it doesn't have any pretenses. And it stands as this sort of um, against um, the unbearableness of human beings and what they do to each other. The pebble seems like an ideal thing. I composed an additional line to that. Which you did? Pebbles do not invade their neighbors. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, so yeah. this is a poem. It's a, it's, a bit, it's a little longer. It's called Mr. Cogito and the Imagination. It's from Herbert's book, Report from the Besieged City. The Mr. Cogito poems, is, he's, sort of, he's sort of Herbert's everyman. He's a figure, if you think of, a, of an ordinary figure, a sort of ordinary Polish guy um, um, with a philosophical name of, uh, you know, Mr. Um, I think, therefore, I am. Um, Mr. Cogito never trusted tricks of the imagination. The piano at the top of the Alps played false concerts for him. He didn't appreciate labyrinths. The, th the Sphinx filled him with loathing. He lived in a house with no basement, without mirrors or dialectics. Jungles of tangled images were not his home. He would rarely soar on the wings of a metaphor, and then he fell like Icarus into the embrace of the Great Mother. He adored tautologies, explanations, idem per idem, that a bird is a bird, slavery means slavery, a knife is a knife, death remains death. He loved the flat horizon, a straight line, the gravity of the earth. Mr. Cogito will be numbered among the species menores. He will accept indifferently the verdict of future scholars of the latter. He used the imagination for entirely different purposes. He wanted to make it an instrument of compassion. He wanted to understand to the very end Pascal's night, the nature of a diamond, the melancholy of the prophets, Achilles' wrath, the madness of those who kill, the dreams of Mary Stuart, Neanderthal fear, the despair of the last Aztecs, Nietzsche's long death throes, the joy of the painter of Lascaux, the rise and fall of an oak, the rise and fall of Rome. And so to bring the dead back to life, to preserve the covenant. Mr. Cogito's imagination has the motion of a pendulum. It crosses with precision from suffering to suffering. There's no place in it for the artificial fires of poetry. He would like to remain faithful to uncertain clarity. Um, the piano at the top of the Alps is an image from Rambeau. And uh, this poem is very instructive to me because I myself happen to like the piano at the top of the Alps. Um, I like the romantic grandeur of the image. Um, I, I like poetry that has this sort of romantic glory and wild imagination. Um, so it's extremely interesting for me to see a, a poetry that a poem that critiques this, you know, one of the great features of what poetry can do. Um, because um, human, be human speech has been in Poland um, subject to great political lies. And um, um, we live in a house um, where people have said all kinds of things. So we need, instead of political doublespeak, what we need 
um, Herbert argues, is let's say tautologies. You don't say that, that slavery is something else. Let's say slavery is what it is. Let's, let's not excuse it. Let's not say a knife is a knife is something else. Let's say a knife is what it is. Let's call things as they are because I live in a country where they don't because of the kind of doublespeak something we're familiar with in our own country. Um, um, and then what I want to, I'm hurrying to get to you is, um, is to the things that Mr. Cogito wants to understand to the very end. Because I think this is a kind of poem in itself, within the poem. And I just want to point to you the kind of things that he, that, he, that he talks of, because I think there are two things that are being paralleled here. First of all, Pascal's Night. Which, you, which, which I take it you know, that the, the, which is, I think, a reference to Pascal's wager. Um, the infinite, in the infinite empty spaces, there is either something or there's nothing. It's either a void or it's not. And that's the wager. The nature of a diamond. The melancholy of the prophets. The prophets are melancholy because they know what's going to happen. And then... Achilles' wrath. Now, this seems to me of a different order than the nature of a diamond because it introduces the hatred of human beings. And what is this going to be? What's this going to lead? And that's going to lead to the madness of those who kill. And that's going to lead to the dreams of Mary Stewart. That is, someone who was about, what, what was she thinking before she was about to be killed? And then that leads to Neanderthal fear, some kind of unbelievable primitive fear when you are about to be killed. And then the despair of the last Aztecs, not just an individual who felt he was going to die or she was going to die, but now a people who know their whole people is going to be destroyed. The last Aztecs and their despair. And then Nietzsche's long death throes. And you remember Nietzsche's incredible sense of suffering over, over uh, uh, of, he couldn't stand a horse being whipped in the street, which triggered his madness. And then against this, the joy of the painter of Lascaux, the thrill of the, what, that, what that painting is, to, the first time to mark this. By the way, um, Herbert wrote a wonderful prose book called Barbarian in the Garden, which I recommend to you. He's the barbarian, the pole, and the garden is Europe. And in each one, each chapter, he goes to a different site of civilization. And the thing that made me think of it at this moment is one of them is the caves of Lascaux. But then, the rise and fall of an oak, the rise and fall of Rome. And I would say this is a kind of rhyme. And the rhyme is, one is a natural cycle, and one is a historical cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he puts them right up against each other in terms of a mystery that can't be fathomed. This is what he wants to understand, what he can't get to the bottom, is all of these different things. And I would say that he is continually paralleling here human-centered things that have to do with human beings destroying each other, against human creativity, the joy of the painter of Lascaux, and um, uh, human be uh, inhuman beauty, like the nature of a diamond. And this is where, it's, it was from reading this that I came to my idea, um, which I want to leave you with, that these poets really wanted to be metaphysical poets. Mm -hmm. That is, what they're really interested in is um, the movement of time, the nature of a diamond, mm -hmm. the question of reality, mm -hmm. what is truth. Mm -hmm. That is, they wanted to be philosophical poets, mm -hmm. but the nature of their historical circumstance was such that it turned their meditation to the tremendous suffering and civitas of poetry and the, the, the role of poetry in a culture. 
And so you have here a somewhat reluctant political poetry that has a wider historical view than most poetries because it's they keep trying to turn their attention to metaphysical concepts, but they keep getting brought back to the fact that people are suffering so much around them and that the country is subject to two shameful ideologies. And what drives this particular poetry is its determination to, to be philosophically accurate, to be truthful to experience, to be faithful to uncertain clarity, and also to have a tremendous responsibility to ordinary people and what they've suffered because that's their culture. That they'd like to just think about the nature of a diamond and the melancholy of the prophets. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the fact that their society is being twice destroyed, they can't do it. And that's where there's the, 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 the tension between, Zagievsky has a, a prose book called Solidarity Solitude. And I think that's the tension in Polish poetry, that po Polish poetry is always in a kind of dialogue between wanting to be individual and then the individual having to justify himself in terms of the society. And a poetry that wants to be metaphysical but in a way is forced to be historical. And that's why I would say that this is of special interest in the, in it, because it creates a kind of laboratory of what happens under certain circumstances when a, an extraordinary group of individual poets set out to realize their personal truths, but keep getting pulled into a kind of collective conversation and dialogue about the purpose of poetry in a civilization that is not free. Well, the result, I mean, that's, that's brilliant. And, and the result is just this laboratory has produced something unlike any literature. That's right, yeah. unlike any yeah. other poetry. Yeah. We have a question. Yeah. I just wonder, how genuinely popular were these poems? Tremendously so. I think that's closely related to what you just said. I mean, it really is a unique situation, almost globally. In some I mean, we've never had anything like that in the United States. No, we have. We have. Select the dialogue between the people and the poetry. That's right. Now, one of the thing, the ironies of Polish poetry is that after the fall of communism, poetry lost some of its power. Yeah. Right. I mean, poetry. The, 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 I mean, this. Herbert especially was a hero of solidarity, and so with Miłosz's poems were passed in Samizdat. I mean, they weren't they weren't officially published, but they had tremendous meaning to a large number of ordinary people, and that that's very much powerfully the case. But since the fall of communism, poetry's begun to lose some of its power. Is that true of literature in general? Novels and yeah, all through this, yeah. all through the Soviet bloc. But it also served as kind of a, a, a break on any impulse that they would have to go more in metaphysical direction. That's right. It pulled them towards civitas in terms of people's understanding and need for it. My question: Before fascism and communism, were any of these poets writing poetry, and was it very different? Well, we read. Was it metaphysical? We read one, the early Miloš one. Yes. Uh, the only Counter. one we read was the Miłosz poem encounter, because these poets were born in North Free Poland, but they came of age during World War II. Yeah. I just want to make a comment because you mentioned Zagansky twice, but only in the context of his prose. And as a matter of fact, he was well known. He is. Yeah. Is, is, I mean, but he's also known for his, his poetry. Yeah, he's what a fact he echoes and parallels and actually throws because he's a little bit further down. He's talking about the half generation, he's the three quarter generation. Yeah, he's the next, I would say he's the next generation. Everything that you're talking about. That's right. In fact, the last poem I put on the worksheet, I don't know if you have it, is Zagievsky's poem Self Portrait. Yeah. And I would. It's also try to praise the related world. Yeah, which, you know, had such importance for us. Right. I mean, if you just take a moment to, if you, I don't know if you know that poem, but it was, you know, famously the last page of the New Yorker after September 11th. And the poetry, it seemed, many people wondered how he possibly could have written this poem so quickly after September 11th. But in fact, because it seemed to speak so completely to our, to, you know, to our experience um, in trying to praise the mutilated world, but in fact the poetry editor had it on her desk. 
already that it wasn't a response to September 11th, but it was a response to a country where huge catastrophes had already happened. And the, mute, the world had been mutilated, and now it's how do we praise it afterwards? That is, after this tremendous collective catastrophe, how does one go on and praise the world? And, you know, I think it's not a surprise that after September 11th, a lot of Americans started turning to Polish poetry, and that poem in particular. But Miłosz also became very popular. And I think the reason was that these poets had suffered a great collective catastrophe, and they had responded. We weren't the first ones, it turns out, to whom terrible things had happened. It turns out it happened in a lot of places, and poetries, other poetries had already responded. But yes, thanks for bringing it up, because I think Zagievsky, I'm going to read a poem to him in a minute. He's one of my dearest friends, but he's also really a wonderful poet who writes prose on the side out of his own experience as a poet, work as a poet. Um, I want to, uh, as the semester concludes or whatever, you know, the year concludes, I'd like to share with you a great Milos poem, a really memorable I, I think it touches upon a lot of things we've talked about. And then we'll have plenty of time because Ed is going to read three of his, three of his own poems from his new book. Elegy for NN. Tell me if it is too far for you. You could have run over the small waves of the Baltic and past the fields of Denmark, past a beech wood, could have turned toward the ocean, and there, very soon, Labrador white at this season. And if you who dreamed about a lonely island were frightened of cities and of lights flashing along the highway, you had a path straight through the wilderness over blue-black melting waters with tracks of deer and caribou as far as the Sierra and abandoned gold mines. The Sacramento River could have led you between hills overgrown with prickly oaks, then just a eucalyptus grove, and you had found me. True. <laughs> True. When the manzanita is in bloom and the bay is clear on spring mornings, I think reluctantly of the house between the lakes and of nets drawn in beneath the Lithuanian sky. The bath cabins where you used to leave your dress has changed forever into an abstract crystal. Honey-like darkness is there near the veranda and comic young owls and the scent of leather. How could one live at that time? I really can't say. Styles and dresses flicker indistinct, not self-sufficient, tending toward a finale. Does it matter that we long for things as they are in themselves? The knowledge of fiery years has scorched the horses standing at the forge, the little columns in the marketplace the wooden stairs and the wig of Mama Fliegeltaub. We learn so much, this you know well, how gradually what could not be taken away is taken, people, countrysides, and the heart does not die when one thinks it should. We smile, there is tea and bread on the table, and only remorse that we could not love the poor ashes in Sackenhausen with absolute love beyond human power. You got used to new wet winters, to a villa where the blood of the German owner was washed from the wall and he never returned. I too accepted, but what was possible, cities and countries. One cannot step twice into the same lake on rotting elder leaves, breaking a narrow sunstreak. Guilt, yours and mine, not a great guilt. Secrets, yours and mine, not great secrets. Not when they bind the jaw with a kerchief, put a little cross between the fingers, and somewhere a dog barks, and the first star flares up. No, it was not because it was too far you failed to visit me that day or night. From year to year it grows in us until it takes hold. I understood it as you did difference. As I, uh, and I don't want to spend much time because I, uh, 
I just wanted really to share the poem. It should be read again, again, again. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's a great poem. It's a great poem. As I understand it, though, just to just touch upon it, he has just learned of... Um, I mean, you know, you can read this poem three times. A lot of Americans could read this and just think it's some sort of beautiful, nostalgic lyric about memory or some early experience. Then a mystery begins to unfold. And, of course, it's called Elegy for an End, and he's just learned of probably of the death of somebody that he had an affair a with lover, as a student, some, a lover, some kind of love. illicit, you know, because right. it, they had a little bit of guilt, but it wasn't great compared to the yeah, yeah. compared to the joy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, so the poem is written on the occasion of having, and he's he's half a half the globe away from from that's where, right. Yeah, yeah. I think it's someone. It's it's uh, the occasion is. <laughs> learning of the death of someone that you once had a very, very passionate relationship to, but haven't seen for 40 years. And she parallels the historic thing, too, because the, I understood it as you did, indifference. Right. Because we cannot... It sets in from year to year and takes until it takes hold. We cannot... As all of these writers are saying, can't well, sustain, life goes on, life right, can't goes on, sustain. and we might as well go with it. Right, can't it's, sustain. Yeah, we can't sustain the memory either of this early love or of, of the German or the, yeah. the yeah. I think it, because of the illicitness is why it's just her initials. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to compare the little, again, the, no, what I was trying to say, to compare the little bit of guilt they had next to the enormous, the enormous guilt that he has in not being able to love beyond human right. power and remember right. beyond it. So it's, right. it's a tiny little guilt he forgives. Yeah. Those memories of that lake house, that little cabin between the lakes, I mean, this is overwhelming. Yeah, poem, it's a so. terrific poem, and yeah. it's precision, and it's yeah. feeling. Yeah. Okay, now, okay. great, you're going to read. And we have plenty, plenty of time. You said you were going to read some of the po some poems. Yeah, I thought yeah. I'd read you um, two poems that are specifically Polish, and then a third one that I think is influenced by the tone, you'll hear it, the tonalities of the, of, of the poetry that we've been discussing. Um, this is a poem called Krakow 6 a.m., and it's a poem that I, that I, that I wrote for Adam Zagajewski. Um, uh, he wrote, a, he t we taught together for 18 years at the University of Houston, and he wrote a poem called Houston 6 p.m., and um, I decided to respond for f five years, or I guess six years, we, when we were teaching at the University of Houston, we created a seminar in, in Krakow um, where we brought American poets. It really was something we wanted to do for Miłosz because Miłosz became too ill to travel back and forth anymore between the United States and Poland. He was just living in Poland, and so, so um, since the linkage between Polish poets and American poets had been so important to him, we decided to sort of bring American poetry to him, and we created this festival, which was really quite wonderful because, uh, because he gave it his support. We got a lot of attention all over Poland. So this is a poem called Krakow 6 a.m. I sit in a corner of the town square and let the ancient city move through me. I sip a cup of coffee, write a little, and watch an old woman sweeping the stairs. Poland is waking up now. Blackbirds patrol the cobblestones, nuns rush by in habits, and the clock tower strikes six times. Day breaks into the night's reverie. The morning is as fresh and clean as a butcher's apron hanging in a shop. Now it is pressed and white, but soon it will be spotted with blood. Europe is waking up. But America is going to sleep, a gangly teenager sprawled out on a comfortable bed. He has large hands and feet, and his dreams are innocent and bloodthirsty. I want to throw a blanket over his shoulders and tuck him in again, like a child, now that his sleep is no longer untroubled. I'm alone here in the old world, where poetry matters, old hatred seethe, and history wears a crown of thorns. Fresh bread wafts from the ovens, and daily life follows its own inexorable course, like a drunk weaving slowly across a courtyard, or a Dutch maid throwing open the heavy shutters. 
I suppose there's always a shop girl stationed in the doorway, a beggar taking up his corner post, and newspapers fluttering from store to store with bad news. Poetry, too, seeks a place in the world, feasting on darkness but needing light, taking confession, listening for bells, for the first strains of music in a town square. Europe is going to work now. Look at those two businessmen hurrying past the statue of the National Bard as her younger brother sleeps on the other side of the ocean, innocent and violent, dreaming of glory. And then this is a poem called um, Elegy for the Jewish Villages. And I began it as a kind of adaptation or translation by a, a Polish poet named Antony Slonimski, um, whose work I like very much. Um, but in the process of trying to adapt and translate this poem, um, I realized that Slonimski was saying things that really bothered me. It turns out when you're translating a poem, you don't get to just change the ending, for example. You have to actually stick to what he's actually saying. So I decided to forget translating it and just write my own poem that used his as a sort of jumping off point. Elegy for the Jewish Villages. The Jewish villages in Poland are gone now. Hrubasau, Karchev, Brody, Felenica. There are no Sabbath candles lit in the windows. No chanting comes from the wooden synagogues. The Jewish villages in Poland have vanished, and so I walked through a graveyard without graves. It must have been hard work to clean up after the war. Someone must have sprinkled sand over the blood, swept away the footprints, and whitewashed the walls with bluish lime. Someone must have fumigated the streets the way you do after a plague. One moon glitters here, cold, pale, alien. I stood in the dark countryside in summer, but could never find the two golden moons of Chagall glittering outside the town when the night lights up. Those moons are orbiting another planet now. Gone are the towns where the shoemaker was a poet, the watchmaker a philosopher, the barber a troubadour. Gone are the villages where the wind joined biblical songs with Polish tunes, where old Jews stood in the shade of cherry trees and longed for the holy walls of Jerusalem. Gone now are the hamlets that passed away like a shadow that falls between our words. I am bringing you home the story of a world, Rubicho, Karchev, Brody, Felenica. Come close and listen to this song. The Jewish villages in Poland are gone now from another one of the saddest nations on earth. Can you read one more? Do you feel like reading? I'd, I'd, I'd love to. And this is a poem. Uh, this is not about Poland, um, um, but you'll see that um, the sensibility of Herbert and, and Zimborska in particular is very much operating in how I structure the poem and how I... How, how, how I try to think about it as a poem. And it got, it, it, I got the idea, it's called The Partial History of My Stupidity. And uh, I, I got the idea from a poem of Miłosz just called The Count, where he says, the history of my stupidity would fill many volumes. And I, I could relate to that. Um, but you know, at a, at a certain age, you can't actually write the whole history of your stupidity. You don't actually have time. Um, so I was thinking of something more like volume three, chapter five. <laughs> so a partial history of my stupidity. Traffic was heavy coming off the bridge, and I took the road to the right, the wrong one, and got stuck in the car for hours. Most nights I rushed out into the evening without paying attention to the trees whose names I didn't know or the birds which flew heedlessly on. I couldn't relinquish my desires or accept them and so I strolled along like a tiger that wanted to spring but was still afraid of the wildness within. The iron bars seemed invisible to others but I carried a cage around inside me. I cared too much what other people thought and made remarks I shouldn't have made. I was silent when I should have spoken. 
forgive me philosophers, I read the Stoics but never understood them. I felt that I was living the wrong life, spiritually speaking, while halfway around the world thousands of people were being slaughtered, some of them by my countrymen. So I walked on, distracted, lost in thought, and forgot to attend to those who suffered far away, nearby. Forgive me, Faith, for never having any. I did not believe in God, who eluded me. Thank you. Thank you. Archive of past Philip Tatey's events is available at philiptatey.org.